Um, next up, we have Jacob Kiri Moreland from the Toronto Seed Library. Jacob is a, uh, a, a, a thinker, a journalist, a farmer, a community organizer, and a person empowerer. I've never seen anyone share the spotlight or uh, leadership in a way that Jacob does. I'm hoping that he's going to empower everybody who sticks around to be a leader in advocating for seed freedom. So Jacob, uh, I'm going to pass it on to you. Hey, thanks Jody. Thanks everybody. Uh, we're going to take a wee field trip. If everybody wants to join me over to that trash can over there. And then we'll, we'll rendezvous back here. <laughs> So um, once everyone's had a chance to look in, tell me what you see. Plastic. Plastic, yeah. Cups. Paper towel. Trees. Twigs. Trees, twigs, yep. Yeah. Leaves. Leaves, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So what I see in there, among all those other things, is I see seeds. There are literal seeds that have been thrown into the trash right down there. And these here are seeds of uh, a plant called calendula. It's an edible medicinal flower, which are growing right over there in those food boxes. Those beautiful yellow, orange flowers. And uh, for some reason, somebody had the, the brilliant idea of throwing them in the trash, although this is pretty common. That's actually a social norm in our society, is um, basically trashing the seeds of life. Um, we produce them en masse, and then a uh, large quantity of those seeds literally end up into the dumps. I like to call, well, and I don't know why we call them the dumps, but. And it wasn't until I was 17, 16, 17, when I started paying attention to the news, what was happening in this world, and I was getting increasingly concerned about um, illegal wars, um, uh, climate change and environmental issues, inequality, poverty, hunger, all these major world issues. And I was reading the newspapers, and our, our leaders were arguing with one another about whose fault it was. Or is the liberals' fault, or the conservatives' fault, or liberals' fault, conservatives? And it just kept going over and over and over again, and none of them were, would assume any responsibility or demonstrate any kind of leadership. And so I was increasingly uh, just very much concerned. And then I started writing into the newspaper, proposing alternatives and calling for leadership. And I still haven't seen that from our elected officials, but I'm hopeful that among a new generation, those leaders will emerge. In the meanwhile, I uh, started gardening. And I came down to the city here and I learned about the power of community gardens through a CD Saturday seed exchange at Witchwood Barns. And I got to point out Katie here, a champion of CD Saturday Scarborough, which is by far one of the most well attended and beautiful events in the city. And a CD Saturday, these are events now that happen across the country and happen on mostly Saturdays, sometimes Sundays. Um, in late winter, early spring, and basically you get seed farmers come, uh, you get community groups, people involved in urban agriculture and food and environment, and it's a, it's a big gardening fair. And there's workshops, and I went there with a friend, and we saw pretty much the, the whole food movement there. There's Kathy's creepy crawlers, the worms, the bee people, the, the seed people, and rooftop gardeners and school gardeners, and I got to see this big, beautiful movement there, and I was just totally blown away, and I was gathering all these seeds, purple carrots, purple beans, purple everything, and I was so blown away, I didn't realize the diversity and all these things that, that had existed and that were growing on in the city, and I gathered all these flyers, and the next day I emptied out my bag like a kid at, after Halloween, and I went through it all, and I saw the, uh, the Toronto Community Garden Network, and I was so inspired by that, I had to initiate a community garden in my community of Aurelia. And within a couple days, created a Facebook group and a letter to the newspaper and, and an email. And all of a sudden, all these people started coming out of the woodwork. And all these people, in the, in the first week, there's 50 people on the page. And the next week, there's 100. And people are emailing and offering space to grow a garden. And then we gathered. And we had our first meeting, a Gardener's Anonymous meeting. We gathered in a circle. And all these people kind of came together and said, hi, my name's Ted, and I'm a gardener. And it was like, hi, Ted. And there's people from all ages and backgrounds there all colors of the rainbow and everybody kind of offered their piece and why they were there and it occurred to me that this community garden was uh, was the solution that i've been looking for not only did it address our our uh, social and ecological crises and the economic crisis but also the existential crisis of why we're here and what our purpose is when you look at the beauty of life uh, as it is that life exists and the fact that we're systemically annihilating life on this planet uh, we're going through a massive species extinction and that's because of the nature of our economy. 
in our society in general. Here we are gathered at Fort York, and as you wander in, you see a history of this place that they call now Fort York. And it goes back the last century, a couple centuries, and, and then it ends in 1613 when Etienne Brule came here, the first European explorer. Then there's 10,000 years that have basically been stricken from the record. Uh, and then they acknowledge about 9,000 BC, uh, native people once occupied this place. And there's a lot of missing pieces there. There's a lot of history, a lot of culture that's been literally eradicated, that's been forcefully destroyed. And, uh, and now people, uh, First Nations people, indigenous people are, are uh, courageously uh, regathering that and sharing it with us, uh, thankfully. And so they must be acknowledged and thanked on an ongoing basis. Because a lot of these seeds that we're saving and that we're growing that we depend on are native seeds. That you know, literally thousands of generations of people have been growing and growing and saving and sharing and passing along. And just in the last generation or two, that, that cycle has been, uh, has been cut, severed. And we become alienated from our, ourselves as human beings, as living beings on this living earth. And now we're consumers in this materialist, capitalist economy where food is no longer that which gives us life. It's no longer sacred. It's become a commodity. And even the solutions proposed often um, in our communities are consumer-based solutions. You gotta shop with your dollar and you gotta buy this and boycott this corporation and support that corporation. Um, whereas I, I'm proposing an alternative and that those that I've met uh, throughout the movement are offering alternatives. So at the community gardens, most of these community gardens, the food is free. It's not sold as a commodity. It's made freely available to anybody. Anybody is welcome to participate. Um, every year, it kept coming back to the seeds. And so around 2008, I came down to the city and I watched as our global economy collapse as the global banks were hoarding all the money and through their own fraud and greed basically collapsed the entire economy of which we're, we're not, well, we're probably unlikely to recover in the near future. And so I was radicalized, or I like to say radishized, into, uh, into exploring some alternatives. And we started the Aurelia Seed Bank, and that was a bin of seeds in my bedroom, and that didn't go very far. And so I learned about the concept of a tool library. And we now have a few tool libraries around the city, and that inspired me to come up with the concept of a seed library. And in 2012, we got together with our uh, fellow gardeners at Occupy Gardens Toronto. And uh, I can talk more about that later. You can ask me about that later. Um, and we started the Toronto Tool Library. And our first branch was in the Toronto, or we started the Toronto Seed Library, and the first branch was in the Toronto Tool Library. And basically, it functions like a book library, and now we have 21 branches located around the city, and we have collections of seeds that anybody can come and borrow, and then we run workshops and presentations to educate people on how to grow and save seeds. People are encouraged to return seeds back to the library. And so among uh, community seeds and rare seeds that people have donated, we also gather and save and circulate um, these commercial seeds that have outlived their commercial shelf life. And so these companies that sell seeds at retail, uh, they have a commercial viability standard. And so when they've outlived their commercial shelf life, they're taken off the shelves and thrown into the trash. Um, or often gardeners, like you and me, not being able to see or recognize the value of these seeds or literally recognize what they are, we literally skip over them and we just throw them right in the trash or we compost them in our gardens or they fall and they sprout and they die and we're not able to, to continue that cycle. And so I propose that uh, growing and saving seeds is, is the best way of continuing that cycle of humanity. And so 9,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, as the sign says, when First Nations people moved down here from the last ice age, you can bet that they were growing and saving seeds. And um, as have people have been doing, basically since the beginning of civilization, which was the beginning of civilization. There's a lot to know about growing and saving seeds. And um, if people would like to know practicalities, I'd like to take us on another field trip. Over to the garden. Yeah, so over here, calendula, the best way I find to gather seeds in your garden is with a Rubbermaid bin or some kind of bin or a bag that you can come and so you can literally just come like this and pick it off and drop it into a bag. You want to start with a clean bag, it'll make it easier to clean and sort your seeds later on. This is Zora, master gardener here in the city, <laughs> has been very influential in helping to start many countless school gardens and community gardens and 
but countless, but... It's, there's countless <laughs> gardens, yeah. Inspiration, inspiration. Yeah. And so um, just the amount of seeds we've collected there, that would probably go for three or four dollars retail or more, many more. Um, and you can see there's literally hundreds of dollars worth of seeds here just in this garden that we could gather. Value that people are just throwing out. Not that you want to put a monetary value on it, but often people cite the cost as a means of a barrier for people to participate. So help yourself, come on in and, and uh, you can just kind of grab some here. And you can see down here on the ground, they're already sprouting, just down there. And so I often just, uh, if I forget my bags or envelopes, because I try not to leave home without any kind of bags or envelopes. Is all this actually seed or is it? The calendula seed is actually very interesting in that these are all the seeds. So they actually, the seeds are different shapes and sizes. So there's a great diversity of shapes within the seeds themselves. Because it doesn't look like what I expect from a seed. No. And seeds continue to surprise me. And I actually happen to think... So this is a seed? Yep. These are all seeds here. This goes for all flowers? Uh, not all flowers, no. Just the calendula. But I happen to think that they actually look like little spaceships. And don't ask me how I know what spaceships look like. <laughs> spaceships and parachutes. You know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you don't have any pockets on you or you don't bring your bags, you can literally just look around you and there's probably trash just floating around the environment, some kind of container that you can, you can grab and recycle and use as a receptacle for seeds. This here is an amaranth uh, in the amaranthus family. And... Um, and an amaranth is a wild, it's a plant family, it's a large plant family that occurs on most continents except Antarctica unless maybe things have changed. But in South America they selected it for its grains and some people there call it quinoa. And uh, other cultures in the, in the Caribbean... So this is a quinoa plant? It's not quinoa, but it's part of the same plant family. And so you'd actually be able to save the grains and use it similarly to quinoa, although over many generations they've selected the seeds to be larger and nutritious. Whereas in uh, the Are Caribbean... edible? Yep. And in, the, and in other cultures have selected the plant for its leaves yeah. rather than for the seeds. And in the Caribbean... Oh, Kalaloo. Kalaloo yeah. in the Caribbean, or oh. as I learned from some Bangladeshi Canadian farmers, uh, they call it lalshak. And it has different names in different cultures and different cultures have selected similar plants for different uses. And so down here we have some leeks, which are in the allium family or the onion family, and uh, which includes, you know, garlic and all kinds of onions and chives and... They produce seeds second year. Yeah, they're biennial plants. So the calendula here and many flowers are, and vegetables are annuals, as well also biennials. And annuals are plants that have a one-year life cycle. So they'll go from a seed to seed in one year, whereas the leeks will take two years. So you won't see a flower until the second year, although sometimes they're stressed and they produce a flower in the first year. Generally speaking, they do take two years to produce. So you're gonna to need to overwinter them in your garden or take them out and keep them in cold storage and then return them back to the garden where they'll then seed. And so plants like kale, cabbage, how many of you have ever seen a cabbage flower? A couple of you, yeah. They're beautiful cabbage flowers. Can you imagine, those of you who haven't, could you imagine where a flower would come from, from this cabbage? It's hard to imagine. Moving on. <laughs> Down here we see more calendula that's being, that's being composted. People have been taking it out of the garden and, and literally uh, composting it. There's also down here What's this one over here with the pink flower? That's thyme. And in here you can see the thyme seeds. And here it's doing a, a natural cleaning process for us, and that's the winnowing process. So working with the elements that people have done for thousands of years, and so the wind will blow off the chaff. Uh, that's a technical term, it'll be on the end uh, exam. And that's all the parts of the seed that are, or parts of the plant that are not the seed. And so the wind there has blown away most of the chaff, and now you can see the thyme seeds. Again, something that uh, whoever's in charge of this garden or is working this garden is considered compost. Um, whereas there's dozens of seeds there. And uh, we can easily put these in envelopes and then take them home and sprout them. 
or you can convert your lawn into a thyme lawn. And just down there, if people wanted, there's a ton of thyme seeds just sitting there. And down here, there's sage. Um, I don't see any flowers. It's possible that it hadn't flowered this year. It looks lemon like a also. lemon balm, yeah. And lemon balm there, the seeds will be forming. It's these little coin envelopes we get in, in bulk and they make for good uh, seed containers. Although I also use medicine bottles or pill bottles because we happen to have an over-medicated society and so you see these in abundance in our environment. Whereas I think that seeds are more valuable than money and more potent than pills. And so we have more seeds here. And you can tell when the seeds are dry that they're ready to go. And again, there's the lemon balm seeds. And the seeds are dense, so they have a much, uh, much denser than the chaff or the plant parts, and they simply uh, sink to the bottom of your container and the chaff will blow away. And so lemon balm is a great uh, herb. If, no one's, if you haven't tried it yet, you want to come and pinch a leaf and give it a rub and a smell. It's in the mint family. It looks like mint, yeah. Lemony. It's lemony, yeah. And we have chives here. Um, and there's some of the, uh, well, that's some more of the thyme there. I don't see any chive flowers here. So over here we have, uh, everyone knows what this one is over here, right? Rhubarb. Rhubarb, yeah. And rhubarb, is my kindred vegetable. <laughs> ruby, I, I refer to it as my dearest ruby. And so on the farm where I moved, where my grandparents moved in 1967, they planted rhubarb plants, which are now just overflowing, as well as asparagus and other perennial vegetables. And these are vegetables that survive over winter, that are hardy, um, that come back every year. And so rhubarb is often said to be split vegetatively or through clonal reproduction. And so that's like taking, cutting off the arm of the cameraman here and sticking it in the ground. And then you literally have two cameramans. What's your name? Peter. Peter. So in fact, you wouldn't have two Peters. You would have one Peter in two different forms. And that's a philosophical problem. And I'll let you work on that. Um, but it also produces a flower. And it's a beautiful flower that comes up in the spring. Often people say to cut it, and that'll continue the vegetative growth, the growth of the leaves. But if you were to allow it to flower, you can save those seeds and plant those, those seeds. But it won't necessarily give you the same um, genetics of the rhubarb because it has new genetics as it's cross-pollinated. And a leaf is poisonous. The leaf is poisonous. It's a good insecticide. And it's also a good mulch and a good mulch. in the garden. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, but you got to be careful because um, I, I learned that uh, rhubarb is a medicinal plant originally and it, from China, the Orient, and it made its way through Europe through the trade routes thousands of years ago where it became more of a vegetable plant. But it has uh, psychedelic qualities. And so you got to be careful because rhubarb is a gateway veg and it'll lead to much harder veg later on like beets and rutabaga. Uh, speaking of which, um, I think that uh, a turnip or uh, potentially a rutabaga over there that seems to be uprooted and so maybe we'll carry on. Um, For folks that want to join the wine tasting in five minutes and if you want to continue on sure. and there's good stuff to happen, I do not want to disrupt the flow here. Sure. Okay, thank you. Is that a turnip or? Yeah, it looks like a turnip to me. So that there, Contest. for the experimental gardener, some of the times I just like to slam it back in the ground and it may root again. And in fact, the next year it'll, it'll potentially flower and produce seeds. So farmers, seed farmers that are doing this on a commercial scale, they'll actually uproot most of their uh, vegetable crops that are biennial and they'll bring them in. And some farmers that are really advanced who are selecting for taste, they'll actually slice a bit off the side of it and they'll taste individually hundreds of rutabagas or hundreds of beets and they'll be selecting for the, the best flavor, the sweetness, and that's uh, partially why we have the greatest diversity that we have, which as we heard from Rachel, we're rapidly losing because we don't have people doing this work anymore because most of us now have become so disconnected we don't even know what a seed is, let alone where it comes from. 
uh, let alone where our food comes from, that we haven't even considered this as an option. And so that's why we've been working on trying to get gardens at schools and seed libraries inside public libraries. I, I failed to mention earlier, but there's over 35 seed libraries now in the province of Ontario, and most of them exist within public libraries. And last spring, Katie and I, are the two co-founders of the Toronto Seed Library, we got an opportunity to go to the first international seed library forum in Tucson, Arizona, where we uh, met with about 125 seed librarians uh, from nine different countries. And there's over 500 seed libraries now around the world. But there's about 900 unique public library systems in Ontario. And there's over 100 now public libraries in the city of Ontario, or in the city of Toronto. And if you could imagine having a seed library in each one of those, just a, a shelf space with a, collections of, a collection of seeds, seeds that are locally sourced from that neighborhood, from those cultural communities, with uh, their names, their histories, their uses, and how to grow and save those seeds. All the information you get from the retailers is how to grow the seeds. They don't include on the pack how to grow and save the seeds because they want you to come back every year to buy the seeds because they want to take away our agency and our control so that they can profit. And increasingly those profits go to a smaller and smaller minority of people. And here we have dill flowering. Um, yep. It may finish its life cycle at the farm near Rillia, the dill is already uh, flowered and seeds have fallen and have been gathered. But here you can see some of the seeds starting to form. These are the flowers and um, being pollinated by uh, some flies, so it's a great bees. Plant. It's a great pollinator plant. If you don't like dill, still need to have it in the garden. <laughs> yeah, and so that's the benefit of planting wildflowers as well and cultivating a diversity of plants. Uh, we have wildflowers going around the garden and fruit trees, flowering trees especially, are wonderful for pollinators, which are critical to fruit production, thus critical to seed production. And so you'll, you'll, the longer you're, you're around these gardens, you'll learn that the bee people are actually the seed people. We're the same people. Because um, it's the same, the same cause here. And down here we have a small plant that I'm going to point out because it's one of my new favorites, and that's called common purslane. And we have some here too that's been tilled out because um, um, it wasn't recognized for its value. But this here has um, one of the highest concentrations of omega-3s of any plant. Um, it's also occurring all around the world and it comes up like a weed. Each plant can produce thousands of seeds. It's drought tolerant. It's a subtropical succulent plant, delicious flavor. And you'll increasingly you'll start seeing this being offered in grocery stores because they're going to pick it up and they're going to they're going to start propping. It's called purslane, and I've learned that there's about 40 different cultivars of it. And so we have one called golden purslane, and it grows upright and has large succulent golden green leaves that are beautiful in a salad. And so again, all the different plants we see in the garden are simply, uh, you know, cultivated from wild relatives. Plants that have been found in the wild and selected and seed saved and grown and and different traits identified and the seeds from those plants are then grown again and, and again and again and again and again um, hundreds or thousands of times. And now scientists have the gall to think that they can speed it up in a laboratory by inserting genes from one species into another in an unnatural process. But what they're really doing is eliminating biodiversity and diminishing the gene pool from which we can further select um, and have greater diversity in the future. So there's actually, um, um, this one here, and those are the seeds right there, those little black seeds there. So they're pretty tiny, uh, some seeds are very tiny, uh, almost microscopic, um, but they're there. And Zora's over there with the... Uh, Hubbard squashes, some butternut squashes. Um, here's more of the purslane down here. You can see it in, in a greater, greater form, and you'll be able to spot that now everywhere you go. It's literally popping up through cracks on the sidewalk, and it'll be occurring in probably everyone's gardens all around. But this one here. What is it? Gold or common purslane. Common purslane. And this here is. Uh, well, that's the thing. Um, my, my grandfather said that a weed is simply any plant growing where you don't want it to grow. 
And so some people's weeds are another's food or another person's medicine. Um, and so before I, I go around and start calling plants weeds or, or people weeds or undesirable and just removing them from environments, I try to learn a little bit about them. You know, their names, their origins, why they're there. And the more you learn about them, the more respect you'll have for them. And the more you'll realize that they're not quite weeds, actually they're beneficial. And so here's another weed over here. And that one's called yeah, lamb's quarter. That. Is, is that the one with the red... Uh, no. No. Oh. no. The, red, the lamb's quarter here, um, it's great and it's when it's young and tender. Um, lamb's quarter, at one point when a lot of people were keeping uh, lambs in their, their gardens, it would pop up abundantly in the lamb's quarters where they kept it, so they, the settlers, they called it lamb's quarter. Um, it's also a member of the amaranth family, that tall purple one over there. Uh, amaranthus is a large plant family, so we have a lot of wild amaranthus happening around. But it's great as a, a microgreen, especially when it gets older, the leaves can get tougher. It also will produce thousands of seeds that you can use similarly to quinoa. Um, there's another one, some called the red-rooted pig's weed. Um, and that also has edible leaves. Again, it'll also produce thousands of seeds and it'll come up in readily disturbed gardens. And the seeds can survive for decades, if not centuries, in the soil. And so you're likely to, to see it popping up um, time and time again. And there's other pl plants in here that I just, I don't know what they are. I can't identify them. Um, so I wouldn't go around calling them weeds just yet. Um, lettuce? lettuce, yeah. Oh, that's lettuce. Okay. So over here we have some cucurbitas, which is the, uh, the Latin for uh, members of the squash or cucumber family. And there's different subspecies here of, uh, of squashes. Two falls ago I had the privilege of traveling to Winnipeg where I met an elder, a native elder, a master gardener, grandmother named Audrey. And she gifted me with some, some seeds uh, in Ojibwe, they called uh, Gete Okosomin, or uh, different dialects, we'll just call it Gete Kosamin, which translates from Ojibwe as ancient squash. And some of you may have seen floating around the internet a picture of a giant orange squash uh, that is rumored to have been found in an archaeological dig and dated to be over 800 years old. And that's the story that Audrey was given at an indigenous farmers conference that happens every year um, around the Great Lakes. And then she gave me about 41 seeds that um, from squash that she'd grown. And last year I grew them out on the farm and they were produced these massive squash that were sweeter than butternuts, um, that lasted for months uh, through the winter and were absolutely amazing. And I'd carry it around town like a squash baby and everybody would be turning their heads and saying, wow, what is that? And I was able to relay that story and I've since heard another origin story um, in that the seeds were grown in isolation by elderly women gardeners from the Miami nation in the state currently known as Indiana. And these women grew this squash potentially for thousands of years in isolation and selected this squash. Um, and then uh, were generous enough to gift those seeds uh, to other communities, which then made it into my hands and into the hands of many more people through the seed libraries. And now people are growing this ancient squash. And so, meanwhile, scientists and laboratories, huge corporations are spending literally hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, to genetically engineer uh, new varieties of plants that are said to be superior when um, these seeds are literally going extinct under our very noses. Um, and indigenous people, the same people who have been, you know, uh, displaced or colonized over the centuries are the same people with the, the, the knowledge and the, and the seeds uh, necessary for our survival. And to think what they could do with that, though, that kind of resources, right? And so the squash here, it's interesting to note that they have both male and female flowers. Some plants, they have a flower um, that some people call a perfect flower, and they'll have both male and female parts in the same piece, whereas the squash actually will produce a separate male and a female flower. And so sometimes if you don't have a fruit forming, that's because of the lack of pollination which again is systemic of a lack of pollinators or lack of bees. And so in some cultures, some places, people actually go and hand pollinate. And that's not a future I want to live in. Uh, 
that's that's the bee's job. And so other plants, it should also be noted, are male plants. The entire plant is a male plant and other are female plants. And so spinach, for example, you'll either have a male plant or a female plant. And so if you're growing seeds for seed, you want to make sure that you have a large enough population size from which to select healthy, um, healthy specimens. Uh, just like us people, if um, I'm not going to go, I don't have a sister, but if I did, I wouldn't make a baby with her. Uh, it's taboo in most cultures because of uh, the potential for inbreeding and of passing along undesirable traits. And so we need a, a diverse gene pool from which to reproduce um, so that we have a healthy offspring. And the same happens with plants. And so when you're selecting and growing seeds for seeds, you want to have a minimum population size for a lot of different things. Um, and so you want to have for a lot of plants like a minimum of six, some people say, for community standards, but don't let that deter you uh, because most of us are not doing it at a commercial scale, we're doing it for our own personal interest and for community. And so any number of plants is fine at this point. But if you want to save, uh, become an expert seed saver or seed breeder, then that's something you want to consider, as well as isolation distances, because members of the same family will cross-pollinate and create hybrids or new varieties which isn't necessarily bad, it could be better, it could be worse depending on what you're looking for. There's also a, a lot to know about the collection of seeds as well as the cleaning, drying, processing, labeling, I can't emphasize that enough. Label your seeds as soon as you get them uh, and maintain that label throughout the year as you're growing or create a map of your garden so that you know where things are planted when so that you can know for sure that that is what, what you say it is so you can share that information with others. And then when you're storing your seeds, you want to keep them in a cool and dry place that's in a controlled climate so that, um, and also free from insects or rodents. Do you focus always on keeping them in paper? I always keep mine in paper bags. Paper bags is often cited as the best, best thing to keep them in, so I'll keep them in paper bags or envelopes and then put those inside of a bin, a sealed bin. Um, you can also sometimes use plastic bags, but you want to make sure that the seeds are, are, are well dried. Not too dry because you can over dry seeds to the point where they'll crack and disintegrate because seeds are alive, they're dormant beings and they need moisture to survive. Um, and they do have um, a lifespan, whereas some seeds can survive for a long time if in the right conditions. Other seeds have a much shorter lifespan. And so, um, yeah, there's seed libraries that have emerged in the last decade, mostly in the last five years. There's also seed banks that have, ex have been ex around for three or four decades um, or a little longer. And these are usually larger scale projects undertaken by governments or large institutions. And the seeds there are more um, focused on conservation of genetics rather than community access and education. And so they're mostly utilized by plant breeders and scientists and corporations. Um, and then there's also the, new, the seed vault, Svalbard, and that's in Norway, um, a couple kilometers from the North Pole. Um, and that has around over 750,000 unique uh, seed crops. And so that makes it the largest seed collection on Earth. But as its name implies, it's a vault. And so only people who put seeds in can take those seeds out. Whereas a seed library is distinct in that anybody can go in and borrow seeds um, and anybody can put seeds in there and it's a public collection. And so at the Toronto Seed Library we've evolved and created a nonprofit called the Seed Library Commons and we always need more people to help us in the administrative aspects and advocacy and organizing. And we have an office at St. Stephen's, a church near Kensington Market. Um, formerly we had our office space at Foodshare, they had to move and downsize and so we've relocated there. We also have 21 branches around the city at different community places. None yet, however, within a public library in Toronto, uh, which is unique or novel in the, in the wider movement in that most are within public libraries. We have delivered workshops through libraries and schools and other places, but we could use more support and help in uh, taking this to the next level so that the seeds we have today are around tomorrow and on and on. Yep. I was wondering with Monsanto, I heard that they developed this suicide seed way prevents people from re replanting it. But if that's the case, where is Monsanto getting its seed supply from? Yeah, so the seeds that are grown like uh, the commercial, like the Monsanto seeds, it's not that you can't grow them, it's that they won't be the same. They won't 
breed true to parent. So like around my place near Rilly, you see a lot of fields planted with GMO soy and corn. And some years the next year, they'll plant it in soy, and then you'll see some corn popping up through there. And that corn will be stunted. It won't be the same corn seed. And so Monsanto has seed fields that they, they cultivate every year, and then that's the same genetics, the exact same genetics. Every seed has the same genetics. That's how they're able to guarantee uniformity. So they're clones. They're, they're clones, they yeah. Diversity. Yeah. What I don't and understand so, yeah. though is if uh, they're controlling the, the seed supply, you know, uh, and GMO is bad for us, we should see a, a public health crisis. And that's been happening for several decades. I'm yeah. just being the devil's advocate. I'm obviously against uh, Monsanto, but well, we do see I a public health crisis. To see uh, yeah. the bottom fallout by now. Well, if you've been paying attention to the news, Monsanto as a company is, has da its days are numbered. It's it's. Um, there's the Bayer deal. Prior to that, Syngenta tried acquiring it, I believe. But that deal is, they, even experts, even people advocates give it a 50-50 chance because of anti-monopoly um, laws around the world. Because it would give extraordinary control or market control for a few companies, which would violate a number of laws established. Um, and so it's just a lack of options. Even if people did want to grow their own, a lot of people um, don't have backyards. And then you say, well, you can grow on your balcony. A lot of people don't have balconies. Or you say you can grow on windowsills. A lot of people don't have windowsills. Um, that's the reality of the situation, uh, let alone a south-facing window with enough space to actually have a meaningful you know, production, a harvest. You can potentially get you know, one salad a week for the growing season, but that's not going to feed one person, let alone a family. What we need is a large-scale uh, transformation in how we use land around the world. Right now, we're rapidly paving over the prime, prime agricultural lands in this country and around the world, just right where we're standing on. Um, and so it's critical that we organize and advocate for larger structural changes, not simply shopping with your dollar, because most people don't have dollars to shop with. Um, that's why we have an increasing use and dependence on food banks. Um, but we need to actually start questioning the nature of money and the nature of this economy and whether or not it's working for the majority of people. And we need to do more than simply voting in another party. And I didn't get to this, but if people want, I can tell you my story a little bit about the last federal election. And I ran in the last federal election in my riding of Simcoe North, and I was the only candidate not representing a political party. And I ran as what I called a cooperative interdependent candidate. And I was promoting cooperation among all people and parties to focus on addressing basic human needs. Food and water first, that which we all share in common. And I ended up getting about 1.1% of the vote or 618 votes, which you look across the country and that put me in the top percentile of all the fringe candidates uh, across the country. And so I believe that if all of us here were to run in the next election and we get you know, five, ten of our friends do the same, and we field literally tens of thousands of candidates in the next election on a shared platform, a very simple shared platform of cooperation on basic human needs, food and water, gardens, then I think we would be able to help facilitate that shift uh, and then also realizing our own power to affect change. But that's the power of community and the power of organizing. And so that's what we need uh, to focus on our social and structural changes rather than the individual consumer-based approaches which are unavailable and ineffective, which is why we're, we're here today, is to meet other people and to organize. What you're saying is it's going to mostly happen at the local level, you know, oh, politicians aren't going to change unless people demand it. Yeah, well, no, we are all politicians. We are all politicians. And every... Shaping policy. We are all shaping policy. With every action we have, this conversation, you and I, right now, this is a political act. It's a vote. We're all voting with every interaction we have with our environment. People become under the impression that we vote once every four years for a politician or a political party to represent us to then make decisions on our behalves. And so we've literally all kind of given into the system or giving our agency and our power to these politicians and parties, not realizing that we have immense power ourselves and that we can leapfrog this system if we want to. So basically what I, I, I got to admit, I've come from a position of privilege. 
I was born into a house with a family, a caring, loving family that was able to, to give me that which I needed. I had uh, access to education and health care and food and water. I had my basic needs met from the beginning. And a lot of people are struggling just to have those met. And so a lot of people, I think, uh, have the potential of kind of uh, transitioning um, themselves off this system of one of, of based on materialism and consumerism. A lot of the things that people are working at, a lot of the jobs people are working are jobs that are not productive. They're, they're working to make money so they can pay for things they don't need, for the most part. A lot of the things that we have are things that are non-essential. And so personally, I've done away with a lot of those things to focus on the things that I really need. Um, and by connecting with other people who share those values, then we're able to increase our power and our options. And so I point to things like the tool libraries. Now, before that, it was just an idea that existed, but now there are actual places you can borrow. There's over 3,000 tools that are available there. You don't need to go and buy tools. Uh, you can go there and you can borrow them. You can learn from others how to use them. Similarly, there's a wealth of information at our local libraries. Libraries are underutilized spaces. There's access to information, uh, communication technologies that are available that are free at the libraries. Um, so, but it's a, it's a transition. It doesn't happen overnight, and it certainly doesn't happen within one generation. And so we also need to maintain our, our hope for long-term change, and we need to make those small steps that add up over time. Revolutions don't happen overnight. Yeah, I think the challenge is the people who are here probably already have a buy-in. But, you know, the mainstream idea with it, family, friends, they don't know and they don't care. And it's hard to see how these grassroots movements are going to help unless there was a public crisis. Yeah. Like food tripled in price or something like that. Well, and it is. It's going up. But what we have to do here is because we don't control those crises, but what we can do is prepare alternatives and we can cultivate those alternatives so that as it does collapse, and it is collapsing, and it has collapsed for many people, um, when it does collapse, that there's alternatives that exist so people do not turn to violence and turn to further destruction, whether of the self or of others, which is what we see all around the world. As dictators are falling and whole societies are collapsing, people are becoming radicalized. And so what I'm proposing is a, is a radical alternative, but one that's based on peace and balance and the regeneration of our life support systems. And so I don't think we're going to see a massive change in our lives. There will be collapses and it'll continue, but what we can do is the best we can with what we have. And if everybody here were to go home after this event, literally, and go to your public library and say, can we have a seed library? I'm very confident that we'll see uh, next year I'll come back to this event and I can say that we have now 60 seed libraries in Ontario. And the next year there'll be 100 because that's the exponential nature of the seed and of these kinds of changes. And that's how it happens. I literally just walked into my library in, in Aurelia and I said, can we have a seed library? And the librarian said, yes. And then the spring we had it and now there it is. And now hundreds of people are walking through that library every day and it's the new normal. Okay, we have a mission. Thank you. No, thank you for your, uh, for your questions.